com commenting in the chat. Can you hear me now? Aha! Yay! Great. <laughs> Great. I was actually really pleased with my introduction, but nobody could hear me then. That's sad. I have to do it again. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks for letting me know. Um, so... Uh, as I've said, uh, welcome, welcome to my channel. Um, and I think there's quite a few of you commenting on now. So thanks, guys. Really appreciate that. Our oh, lovely welcome, Kinga, support worker, applying to courses for the first time. Lovely. Welcome, everyone. Um, right. So welcome to my channel, Clinical Psychology Community UK. Um, you can hit subscribe and then you uh, will be notified of any other uh, videos or webinars straight to your phone. So uh, yeah, click, click subscribe on that one. And I'm, I'm hoping everyone's joined uh, our Facebook group. If not, um, it's for people applying for the clinical doctorate uh, training program in the UK, which is an NHS funded program, hence the, the title today. Um, and it's, it's UK DeclinSci Applicants Reflective Space. So if you type that into Facebook, click join, then, uh, then you'll be admitted to that one. So thanks, guys. Thank you. There's uh, loads of you joined in today. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And tonight we're going to be talking about how clinical psychology functions in the NHS. Um, I'm Holly. Uh, I'm currently an, an NHS assistant psychologist. Um, I'm a, I've applied to the clinical doctorate six times. This is my sixth time. Uh, so while I haven't got a place yet, um, I'm hoping that this is the magical year that uh, that we that we get on. So a lot of this stuff is mainly um, to help us all learn together. It's not just me being an expert because I'm absolutely not. <laughs> a lot of this is just based on my experiences and stuff. Um, uh, so if you've got any comments uh, throughout, I've got an eye on the chat, so uh, pop it in there. Or if you want to pop in and let us know where you're watching from, um, what role you're in, if you're NHS, non-NHS, what you'd hope to gain from today. Um, and yeah, any questions uh, and I'll address them in the Q&A section. So I guess we can get started. So today our aims are um, to go through um, how clinical psychology functions in the NHS, what purpose does it serve? Um, and to do that, I'm going to talk a little bit about the NHS, um, some of the history, the constitution and some of the values um, that are really important. And um, in the in the NHS, people that work in the NHS, you know, you, we need to be aware of these these values, the constitution, the history behind it, because it is really important. And then we're going to look at all these different functions of clinical psychology within the NHS. So we've got MDT work, multidisciplinary team work. Um, I will explain all of that. If you've never heard of that term before, don't worry. We've got clinical work, research, supervision, leadership, teaching and training. And then we'll have a bit of a Q&A section as well. So uh, if there's anything on there that you immediately are like, oh, I don't know what that means, or you've got any questions, please pop it in the chat. That's fine. Right. So history of the NHS, without wanting to make this sound too like a history class. Um, the NHS was launched in 1948. Like that was really surprising to me that in World War Two there was no NHS. I I just that sort of blew my mind. Um, it was overseen by the Minister of Health, Nairon Bevan. Um, if you work in Wales, which I do, um, then there is an Iron Bevan Health Board, as he was um, Welsh. So uh, they're very proud of the fact that he he oversaw the launching of the NHS. It was preceded by decades of prep work, preparatory work. Um, there were there were publicly funded ways of getting healthcare. Uh, some councils might have funded some things, but broadly there was no NHS. It was it was very difficult to access healthcare and by healthcare, you know, effective healthcare as well. So uh, there are lots of different um, works that were behind it. Some of the key ones: the Dawn of the he the Health Age by Benjamin Moore. That's a great one to read. Um, Minority Report of the Royal Commission on the Poor Law by Beatrice Webb. Um, I've just had a quick look on Google about that one because it's quite a long um, piece that's been sort of scanned on. Uh, but that's, you know, that's um, precipitated a lot of this, a lot of how the NHS was born. And The Citadel by Cronin as well. That's another one to check out. I'll pop all of these on the Facebook group anyway, uh, if you're interested in, in reading a little bit more about it. So the essential values of the NHS at that time were that the services helped everyone. Healthcare was free and care would be provided based on need rather than one's ability to pay. So um, 
it all sounds really ideal now. Um, so they, they were the main founding values of the NHS. That was the main aims of the NHS um, when it was launched. And now um, we, in the sort of devolved governments that we have in the UK, so particularly as I'm focused on Wales, as I work in Wales in the NHS. Um, so the Welsh NHS has a different way sort of of doing things to the Scottish NHS. Um, and you can see the logos down there in the bottom. And the Northern Health and Social Care Trust is um, Northern Ireland, I believe, but there's not a huge amount of information on that. So I've just focused on NHS England, Wales and Scotland um, for tonight, uh, because that's sort of where more of my experience lies. If you know anything about uh, Northern Ireland NHS and how that all works, then yeah, please ch chime in. Any, any opinions will be gratefully received. So let's look, we'll start at all the different values, right? So let's start with NHS England. There are six key values. Broadly, they're the same. Broadly, they all mean the same sorts of things. But in the NHS in England, this has come from the NHS constitution. So what sort of founded the NHS? Um, that is available online, but I'll pop it on the Facebook group as well um, for you to read through. Definitely an essential read if you're going for an NHS job um, or the doctorate because that is NHS funded um, and it, what they want to see is that you are committed to the NHS, that the NHS values align with your values um, and that you genuinely care about the NHS and what it stands for. And if you don't, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. Um, it, it just might be worth rethinking what it is that you want to do. If, if you don't believe in the NHS, then applying for an NHS position is probably not the best thing to do. But anyway, NHS England then, six key values. Working together for patients, respect and dignity, commitment to quality of care, compassion, improving lives, and everyone counts. Um, so these values underlie the seven key principles of the NHS that are in the NHS constitution as well. Um, the NHS constitution also documents our rights as patients and the responsibilities of patients and the public to the NHS. You know, for example, use the NHS wisely, um, use it when you are most in need, those sorts of things, um, which I think is also a really important part of how clinical psychology works in the NHS. So moving on then, we're going to look at uh, Wales, six core principles. We put our patients and users of our service first. We seek to improve our care. We focus on well-being and prevention. We reflect on our experiences and learn. We work in partnership as a team and we value all those who work for the NHS. Again, very similar, really similar things, uh, you know, to the NHS England six key values. Um, the one that stands out there for me is we reflect on our experiences and learn. Um, obviously, that is the whole purpose of, of this. Uh, and as, as psychologists, as pre-qualified psychologists, it's very important for us to be reflective and to be able to learn from our mistakes, not only our mistakes, um, but the things that we do well as well. So those are the uh, six core principles of NHS in Wales. And now moving on, the NHS Scotland has four key values. The first one is care and compassion. The second, dignity and respect. The third is openness, honesty and responsibility. And the fourth is quality and teamwork. So you see that they are all broadly similar. You know, dignity and respect are important. Care and compassion, they're all in there, you know, ensuring that what we do provide as quality care that is all in all of them um but it, it, they just have them worded slightly differently but when the final thing to say i suppose on nhs values is that each nhs board or trust will have their own values so if you're going for uh, any job within a health board or health trust it's really important to know what their values are i've been asked in several assistant interviews what the values are of that NHS trust and which sit well with me. So that's really important. I would definitely recommend if you're applying for a job or got an interview, look at the values, look at their website, find out a little bit about that. Um, and what can also be really helpful that I found really helpful writing my application this year is to list what my values are. So I've just sat down and thought, well, what's really important to me? And I've tried to do it 
away from this presentation where I've listed all the NHS values and what I know the NHS values are. I've tried to be really honest with myself and think about what is important to me. For example, in my application, I've written about how I really am committed to the NHS. I think it's a fantastic thing. Um, the liberal side of me thinks that absolutely um, healthcare should be free. It should be accessible to everybody, regardless of your background, regardless of your ability to pay. And the whole idea of NHS privatisation freaks me out, quite frankly. It really concerns me. Um, so I've written about that to show in my application that I, I, I do actually care about the NHS. It's really important to me. And, and beyond saying, I care about the NHS, you know, you're actually kind of giving a bit of information. But, but that came from reflecting on what my values were and what was really important to me, what I wanted to achieve in my life, the things that I have found satisfying and helpful in the past, the experiences that I've had. Um, for example, one of my absolute favourite jobs was in weight management. I loved it. The team were lovely. Everyone was lovely. It was an NHS service to help battle obesity. And it was... It just, I went to bed every night feeling happy, like I'd contributed. And that all came from about these values. And, and that's why, because it really means something to me that anybody can access that care. So I would honestly think, you know, we're coming up to doctor application season. <laughs> uh, think about what your values are and how they align with the NHS values. Um, don't just write a list of NHS values and you care about compassion and all of that because so does everyone quite frankly really make it personal to you so moving on then how does any of this apply to how clinical psychology functions in the NHS oh, well clinical psychology within the NHS so how does it apply to you as an aspiring clinical psychologist well while we are aspiring psychologists most of us I imagine if we're if we're watching the webinars we're also pre-qualified psychologists. I quite like that term because it reminds us that we are qualified in other ways. We are going to qualify. <laughs> There's the hope that we will. We're just pre-qualified. Um, and it also kind of validates our experiences. Uh, we're not just an assistant. You know, we are qualified staff with skills. Um, but as a pre-qualified psychologist, you are subject to the same sorts of procedures and policies that you will be when you're qualified. Um, so it's really important to have an understanding, basically, of values. So clinical psychologists and us as pre-qualified psychologists must ensure that our practice is aligned with these values and that our practice in everything that we do is consistent with those values. There are lots of different ways. So those are the categories that I mentioned at the beginning um, and basically the idea is if a clinical psychologist has an MDT meeting in the morning then they have a, a therapy case um, and then they go to supervision those three activities they are showing the, their values they are adherent to the NHS values they're treating everyone with dignity and respect you know they're, they're being compassionate those sorts of things as well clinical psychologists particularly in the UK uh, I can only speak for the UK because I don't know how it is in other countries I'm afraid um, I'm not particularly well traveled um, we train as scientist practitioners um, so it's really important to work in an evidence-based way and to promote this way of working you know in terms of psychologically informed practice so that's kind of where the teaching and training comes in so let's look at these in a little bit more detail starting with MDT work or multidisciplinary work. Um, now this, if you have never worked in a multidisciplinary team before, this might sound like it's a really big thing that's a bit scary. Um, multidisciplinary, let's break that down. Multi is multiple. Um, disciplinary, disciplines, and team is team. Um, so clinical psychologists often work as a team with other disciplines um, to form a multidisciplinary team. Um, and what we mean by that, they could be working with doctors, psychiatrists, nurses, dietitians, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, social workers. And all of these different occupations have different ways of training and different values behind them and different approaches. Like I said, clinical psychologists are very scientist, practitioner, evidence base, improvement, reflection, improvement, development. Um, and I, I'm not trained in any other discipline. So, you know, I, I don't I don't know exactly how they're trained, but they do have different ways of training and different things are, that are important. 
clinical psychology reflective practice is really important and it's really highly valued um, and it isn't as much you know in being a being a physician being a doctor it's not it's not um, a, a, as an essential part of, of their work clinical psychologists almost always work as part of an MDT it's how the NHS um, does a lot has a lot of services now um, I think yeah I don't think I've had any experience of not working in a multidisciplinary team to be fair and I've had NHS and non-NHS roles so in that team the clinical psychologists provide a psychological perspective to a service user's treatment. They are there to either provide an assessment, perhaps, or maybe some therapy or some, some form of intervention for a person um, to tackle their psychology. If I go back to the weight management example, we were an MDT. I was working as a support worker at the time, but we had a, a consultant endocrinologist so a doctor someone who looked at um diabetes and medications and and you know the, the blood tests and things like that we had a dietitian we had physiotherapists and psychologists and they would all work on different bits of some with someone to help achieve their goal of losing weight so a dietitian can help with the meal planning a physiotherapist can help with the exercise a psychologist can help with some of the reasons that we eat um, problematically and and therefore gain weight but the psychologist's role in that is to provide that psychological perspective with all of their training on theory and therapy and different models and different frameworks to understand issues um, is to work with that person to achieve aims for them but sometimes if a service user doesn't require psychology input the psychologist can help the other colleagues to kind of understand what the issues are or maybe provide a reflective practice space so that brings me on to the other sort of part um, is to promote psychologically informed practice. So the evidence base, reflective practice. Um, you know, it might be that um, for weight management, uh, CBT might be the evidence based intervention. Therefore, that's the one that they receive. Or it could be actually there's been emerging evidence that an ACT approach or a compassion focused approach is is really beneficial for people um, trying to lose weight. So let's develop a course and let's do it that way. There are lots and lots of different scope there. But essentially, it's to provide that psychological perspective and apply that psychological theory to whatever's going on in that situation. Um, and if we think back to the NHS values, you know, in England, it's working together for patients. In Wales, we work in partnership as a team and we value all of those who work for the NHS and NHS Scotland, quality and teamwork. So do you kind of see how this one specific function of clinical psychology in the NHS is underlined by all of those values that we spoke about at the beginning? Um, basically, um, you know, we're trying to work as, as a team. We're trying to be respectful and you treat people with dignity and things. If you've got any questions as we keep going on, then yeah, pop them in the chat and I'll try and try and address them. So moving on then, let's look at clinical work. Um, and I think this is a lot of, to be honest, naively, when I first wanted to go into clinical psychology, when I was studying um, at my undergrad, I was thinking, oh, yeah, I just want to go and do therapy with people. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing at all. I think that was just what my understanding of a clinical psychologist was, is that I would qualify in therapy and I would go and do therapy. I don't think I had a complete understanding of what being a clinical psychologist would involve. Um, I'm still here trying to do it. So <laughs> I do want to do it. It's just uh, I think I had a warped view of what it was. But in terms of clinical work, that might be a broad part of a clinical psychologist day or, or, or week. It really depends on, on what stage in their career they're at, what, you know, what role they hold. Um, but broadly, clinical work uh, usually follows the framework assessment, formulation, intervention, evaluation. So assessment is sort of looking, looking at what the problems are, working out, you know, what the presenting problem is. Uh, some sort of symptoms or things that maintain it, putting it into a formulation. Um, if you're interested in, uh, I can go through a little bit about formulation um, in, an, in a different webinar, but there is, um, there's some brilliant webinars available by Dr. Emily Barney. She is fantastic uh, and she's got two assistants with her. I'm really sorry, I can't remember their names, but they're brilliant and they're talking about formulation and stuff. Um, if you're interested, comment um, afterwards and I'll, and I'll uh, post some links to the video recordings because they're great. Uh, intervention, so, you know, 
doing some sort of intervention with someone and then evaluating how that went. Someone, a clinical psychologist, might hold a caseload. So that could be neuropsychological assessments, it could, you know, memory assessments, um, it could be therapy, uh, it could be it could be lots of different things. It could be just assessments, it could be, it could be anything really. Promoting evidence-based knowledge and practice. Um, so this could be developing um, an evidence-based course or contributing to the evidence base. Um, doing uh you know inf making sure that you're following the guidelines the nice guidelines or matrix cumry guidelines matrix scotland guidelines and inclusion as well um making sure that we're trying to make services as inclusive and accessible as possible and that that can be done through clinical work it could be that um, as a psychologist, you've read some research that shows that uh, older adults, for example, um, access services less. So how are you as a psychologist going to make that better? How are you going to improve that access? And so on. And again, if we think back about the NHS values, you know, respect and dignity, commitment to quality of care, compassion, improving lives, everyone counts. We put our patients first. All of this underpins the clinical work that psychologists do. And it really depends on the service. It really depends on the nature of the service as to what work that is. Um, it could be some short term work. It could be longer term. It really depends. Thinking about research then, as I said, we are going to be trained as reflective scientist practitioners, which means that research, having a knowledge of research is helpful. That might mean that you go on to a research position, you know, perhaps work at a university, for example, and, and, and go on to do research. Um, but in the NHS, uh, what this usually means is contributing to the evidence base through audits, service evaluations, intervention evaluations, case studies, um, trying out new psycho psychotherapeutic models, compassion focused therapy, adding to the evidence base. Um, and the way that we do that, you know, we have we have patients. Um, we we have patients that have these difficulties and we have access to them and if they're happy and informed about the research then they might they might contribute um and and help contribute to that evidence base but you do that through identifying clinical or research need so uh another example is um so we i i'm just trying to think of an example that i can use I'll use weight management again. So uh, we found evidence that an ACT-based approach, um, group therapy approach, was there was some emerging evidence to suggest that it could be useful for people trying to lose weight. So my psychologist sort of suggested that to us and, and to the team, knowing that I had an interest in psychology and wanted to get involved in, in service development and stuff. She identified that there was a need for that because we actually didn't have any therapy groups, uh, not based on any models running in any of our services. So actually there is a clinical need for that, as well as there being a research need to contribute to that evidence base. And so we managed to do it that way, um, which not only helped helped me, it helped our psychologist to develop. It helped us both. Um, it helped the service because we're doing something innovative, but it helped the clients that got involved as well. So that was really important. And again, thinking about the values, um, commitment to quality of care, doing research, things like audits and service evaluations, where you're looking at whether a service is is meeting its targets, meeting its aims. Um, that counts as research and that's really important um, because we are trying to deliver the best possible care that we can. Thinking about ethics as well, um, that's, you know, you will be taught that anyway. Where if you study psychology anywhere and do any form of research, ethics is massively important. Um, but the other thing that research could lead to is policy. You know, we could do some research that leads to further research that leads to a change in policy i mean that's just one of my absolute pipe dreams is to inform policy on on, on mental health and physical health campaigns and and ideas particularly around obesity and how and how and body image and appearance and how we how we uh, engage with that those sorts of messaging um but that's just another part of how clinical psychology can function in the NHS, what purpose that it serves is to do research is, you know, in, in terms of mental health. Um, for example, really topically, 
the BPS uh, uh, has got lots of NHS clinical psychologists doing research to see how COVID has impacted on their patients um, from different groups, um, from uh, minority ethnic groups or older adults or people that are underrepresented, learning disabilities, those sorts of things. So moving on then to supervision. Um, I hope some of you will have had experience of supervision. Uh, in the NHS, uh, I mean, I can only speak for me. I've only ever had clinical supervision in my current role. Uh, I had like caseload management and, and line management supervision, but it's not quite the same thing as clinical supervision. Um, but how clinical psychologists uh, do supervision in the NHS is for pre-qualified staff like us, for assistants, for support workers, or for people in training, um, for therapists, practitioners, other psychologists who might be sort of more newly qualified or, uh, or need some of their expertise. And through supervision, that improves access to psychological knowledge, actually. You know, a lot of my reflections have come from my fantastic supervisor. They've a load of them. And the way that I am now and the way that I think about things now has changed so drastically um, in the last however many months I've, I've worked here. And she has improved my access to that psychological knowledge because she will ask me questions that make me think, oh, yeah. And then I get down into a rabbit hole of thinking and then I go into some research and independent study and find out some different things about psychological knowledge. Um, and it is inspiring as well. And enhancing reflective skills. Um, that's another thing that my supervisor has been brilliant for doing. And then if we think about the NHS values again, you know, particularly in Wales, we reflect on our experiences and learn commitment to quality of care, working together for patients. All of the values underpin what clinical psychologists do. In terms of leadership, this is something that is taught a lot towards the end of doctorate courses uh, in for training in clinical psychology. Um, because in my experience, a lot of psychologists that I've worked with have worked in leadership roles. They've either been, either been uh, service leads, consultants, that sort of thing. Um, I've had plenty that were sort of members of the team as well, but a lot of the time, people that uh, qualified as clinical psychologists, you know, and have got a lot of experience in that role will end up in leadership positions. So it's, it's important. So they will take consultant or lead roles and they'll lead services in a psychologically informed way. So this could be via service action plans. So, for example, making sure that you write an action plan for the service. What needs changing? How is that influenced by psychology? So, for example, making sure that all the interventions we offer are evidence based and adherent to the guidelines, for example. Supervision groups, as I've mentioned previously with supervision, um, that's uh, a really, really helpful way of not only helping staff develop, but helping with their well-being and making them feel valued in some ways, you know, that there is a leader of our service that is here to talk to me and here to help us. That that does make a difference, I think. And in management meetings, you know, so they will provide a psychological perspective in quality meetings, risk meetings, intervention meetings, planning meetings, that sort of thing. Um, and again, I think even more so when you become into a leadership role, those NHS values really need to really need to be embedded in your practice by then, you know, being compassionate, um, supporting everyone that you work with, working together for our patients, those, you know, those sorts of things are really important. So that's another way that clinical psychology functions in the NHS. They often provide leadership roles, which is, again, so important. And I know it's easy for me to say this as, as a white female in my 20s, as is everybody trying to access psychology slash that is everybody who is qualified in psychology. I understand that. I really do. But that's equally as important why we need to widen the access um, for people from working class backgrounds, from underrepresented groups, ethnic minority. That's why we need to widen the access so that then we have eventually, you know, 20 years time, the people that are training now is to be clinical psychologists. If that access is improved, they'll be leaders. They will be in leadership positions and then we'll have a more representative group of people in leadership. Um, that, so that's particularly important in this situation. It's it's important in all situations to make sure that we're trying to access widen access to the profession.
And the final one then is teaching and training. Um, so this could be on lots of different ways. It could be reflective practice, psychological models, evidence base, good practice guidelines, case studies, assessment, formulation, intervention, evaluation. So, for example, uh, part of my role is split. So I work in primary care at the moment and uh, part of my role is to improve access for older adults to primary care. Uh, so I sort of sit in the older person's specialty sort of so I go to their meetings they are it's a psychology specialty meeting so there we have lots of different um psychologists at pre-qualified newly qualified long time qualified <laughs> consultant lead positions so we have a huge range of experiences and that's where I've learned lots of different things we've had lots of psychologists present different things um, and teach different things and do lots of different training um, and that's been really, really helpful. Um, and it's definitely a part, it kind of ties in with leadership, but it's definitely a part um, of clinical psychology that's becoming more important in the NHS, I think, um, particularly in terms of evidence base. Um, but basically, it all contributes to making sure that services are psychologically informed, essentially. And... Again, with teaching and training, it's taking that that leadership role and, and again, making sure that your values are consistent um, and adherent as well. Um, yeah, so it, that's really important. So those are the main ways that it functions in the NHS. You've got your MDT work, you've got your clinical work, you've got research, supervision, leadership and teaching and training. And this is just my experience. Clinical psychology is a hugely broad profession. There's loads of different things that it could be. Um, you know, so th these, this is just based on my experience, but there's loads of different things. I've just seen a comment there. Uh, yes, this live video will be on the channel afterwards. Yes, I'll make sure that it is available and it will be in the playlist, um, reflective webinars or I think that's what it's called. Um, and I'll make sure the link's available on the Facebook group as well. So we've come to our question and answer section. So if you have any questions, please pop them in the chat. Well, while I'm going on about this question, um, yeah, please pop them in and I'll try my best to answer. As I said at the start, I'm not an expert. I'm just someone who is happy to share their experiences through this platform. So the question then, how do I show my understanding of clinical psychology in the NHS in my doctorate application? Well, as I say, I have written many applications, right? So this is my sixth time. Um, I've managed to get two interviews, interviews two successive years. So I think I know how to do an application-ish. So I can only say what's worked for me. And also I can explain some of the things that I've learned um, this year, because this year there's been so many more videos available. I don't know whether it's because everyone is sat at home, so they feel they've got more time to be able to do videos to help. But there's loads of massively helpful videos on your doctor application and what's best to put in it and how to structure it and everything. But I will try and address some of this. So how do I show my understanding of clinical psychology in the NHS? in my application. As I said at the start, a way that I sort of thought to do it is talk a little bit about how it's concerning that the NHS is being privatised because it shows your understanding of some of the challenges that the NHS faces and where clinical psychology fits into that. Um, so for example, saying that uh, privatisation, what is the impact of NHS privatisation? Well, it means that services uh, eventually might be completely privatised, meaning that people is not as accessible for everybody. It could be that, um, which it does not align with my values, you know, what I believe. Um, and it doesn't actually line up with how the NHS was founded either or what the current NHS constitution is. Um, so there's there's one way that you can show that. But essentially what we're talking about is in the personal statement section. Um, and thinking about some of the issues that you might have faced in the NHS, working in clinical psychology or non-NHS, how hard it is to get into the NHS even could, could be something that you reflect on. Um, it could be, yeah, like I was saying about um, there not being uh, much diversity in, in terms of clinical psychology, in terms of the NHS, arguably, at leadership positions um, in, in psychology. Uh, think about some of the some of the issues that you've experienced. I mean, if I sat here and told you all of the things that I've experienced, 
that would you would be writing my application you wouldn't be writing yours so it's really important to think about what you've experienced what you think what's important to you what your values are now I will do the next webinar actually is going to be on um, reflecting in a doctorate application so we are going to cover that completely in a, in a separate webinar so um, don't worry too much about that I haven't got any other questions come in so far um, so if you haven't got any other questions I'm happy to move on but I don't have to if you have any questions I'll, ca I'll crack on with the summary and if you've got any other questions about anything that we've spoken about today let me know in the chat so in summary clinical psychologists within the NHS can promote psychologically informed practice form part of a multidisciplinary team in most cases they hold caseloads therapy cases assessment formulation intervention evaluation often take leadership and consultancy roles promote NHS values so those are some different things. I've just had a question come in. Thank you so much. So this one is, how do you keep informed on difficulties within the NHS? That's a great question. And that is a question that I had until I, I mean, really, until maybe this year even. Um, so, and I think the reason for that is because for the two and a half years before I was outside of the NHS I was working in a in a non-NHS sort of CCG funded um, organization in substance misuse uh, and I felt very out of it whereas now I think there's loads of different sources you can get it from I think it makes a difference if you work in the NHS and what I mean by that is that it's easier to know about some of the difficulties that are going on that's why it's easier um, it's not impossible if you're working outside of the NHS I think you just have to put more work in so the first thing I'd say is news have a look at the news as much as we want to all avoid the news at the moment because the news is scary and it makes me sad um we should be looking at the news so for example on, on BBC news for example they've got a tab that says NHS so that can keep you informed of, of different things uh if you were working the NHS currently chat to some colleagues see what's going on um that way uh or on your intranet so a lot of health boards will have an intranet or a website that only staff can access through nhs computers and things like that um and that will have potentially more different information than what might be in the news um so that's really important but as well thinking about what you've experienced either as a service user in the nhs or um yeah as a service user or as a professional in the nhs think about some of the different issues you've experienced so are waiting times any more difficult how has covid impacted it and that could just start with you having a bit of a brainstorm thinking right so covid has happened what if i write covid on a piece of paper you can just write covid and then think do like a brainstorm and think about a mind map even and think about well what are the different impacts on different people and how do we think that might have happened is there any evidence is there any literature is there any research being done so you can think about it that way um try and link it in to wider things um and theories potentially I hope that helps to answer your question. So thank you so much for that one. And I've had a load more written, so uh, I'll, I'll try and whiz through them as much as I can. Um, so I've uh, got one here. Did you talk about values and understanding of clinical psychology in the personal statement section? I'm already struggling with the character limit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, character limit is a nightmare, isn't it? Like I, I'm on version 10 of my application this year. Like that's how many drafts it's taken to get it down. Um, and the thing is, with the doctor application, you can't put everything in. You literally can't put everything in because otherwise you'd be using shorthand. Like you literally can't do it. Um, so try not to worry too much about putting absolutely everything in. The thing I would focus on, like I said, think about what your values are. Think about what your experience of the NHS is. Think about what you want to achieve um and put that in the in the personal statement section so i put that in my in the first question in what way have your research and work experiences made you a better candidate for training so thinking about current nhs issues um what concerns you that's that's a really good way of doing it because it shows what your value if you're concerned about some of the challenges facing the nhs it kind of shows that you are compassionate that you're aware of those sorts of things um 
But again, it, it may not be an essential thing that you need to put in there. It really depends on you and what's important to you. For example, it, this is really important to me. So that's why I've put it in there. And it feels it feels significant to me. It feels important to put it into my application because I think that is that does affect my practice. And that's why I put it in. Um, you don't have to put it in just, just to put it in. Only put in things that are important and relevant, obviously. Um, I hope that helps, but I will be doing a separate webinar on the doctorate application in a couple of weeks, so don't worry about that. Um, another one here, how can you show leadership at, at a pre-qualified level? That's really great. So fantastic question. I've got a couple of different branches here. So firstly, um, if you're a member of the BPS, they have a pre-qualified uh, group in the D Division of Clinical Psychology. They do lots of different events and webinars and things. Um, I know there's a whole argument about the BPS and that we have to pay to get this content. I do understand that. Um, but if you are a member of the BPS, the pre-qualified group do a lot um, of stuff like that. They've got a couple of webinars coming up, I think, about showing... No, sorry, I'm lying. They had a couple of webinars. Um, so if you can access them, try and go on their page um, or speak to someone who is a member. They might be able to access the slides and stuff for you. But they did some webinars on um, how to show leadership um, at pre-qualified levels and how to develop your leadership skills. So have a look at that. But I'll summarise some of the points that were made because it was, it was a really informative webinar. Um, I think it's so I think sometimes people are natural leaders and sometimes people have to really work hard to to feel confident in those sorts of positions. I think sometimes people just fall naturally into them and sometimes people are a bit more aware of how stressful it is. Um, so my last role was a leadership role. It was a team leader role. Uh, and I was absolutely bricking it, terrified before I started it that I was 24 at the time some time ago now but I was 24 at the time and thinking that I was managing people that were older than my parents uh how on earth were they going to listen to me a 24 year old with basically no substance misuse experience it was terrifying it was absolutely terrifying but um it was a way for me to show leadership and I knew that's why I had to go for the job so things that were involved in my leadership position were chairing meetings uh were doing supervision developing training um developing manuals developing lots of different things caseload management uh loads of things like that and the reason i mention that because obviously we're not all in leadership roles i understand that is basically looking at what service you're in what role you're in what the scope of your role is talk to your supervisor and say i want to do something that shows a bit more leadership how can i get there um, and the reason I mention my experience is because things like chairing meetings or doing a presentation out on a case study or a paper that you've read or something like that, or getting together like-minded people um, that live in the same place as you or that work in the same place as you to do reflective practice groups, something like that would be really, really helpful um, in showing leadership. Um, I think another another sort of thing yeah so part of the reason I wanted to develop my leadership skills which is partly why I'm doing these webinars is to uh because leadership is is not only about being able to speak in front of people because I think that is an important part it's about being confident and this helps me with my confidence that's that's one of the reasons that I've done it um I think I think they're the main reasons but I think at a pre-qualified level speak to your supervisor this is what I did so I had a uh, professional development review PDR yearly as we all will be subject to at some point um and we have different goals on there and uh I was thinking right I want to show some leadership because I know that that's an important competency of a you know competent clinical psychologist and so they thought okay well why don't you do a couple of presentations lead a service audit uh do this and they will help you with suggestions it's okay for you not to have all the answers you're there to learn and that is actually the beauty of being pre-qualified like I, it's taking me some time to realize this but a lot of the time I thought I, I'm perfectly ready to be on training I wasn't like I absolutely wasn't um and being able to say that I don't know and that I need help is the biggest thing I've learned. So it's okay to go to your supervisor or speak to your colleagues and say, what can we do to make this service better? Start there. And then, you know, that's already 
promoting leadership. That's already developing your leadership because you're trying to include other people and you're trying to, you know, fix a service. Fix is the wrong word. You're trying to develop and improve a service. That's really important. I hope that helps. Um, happy to do a couple of uh, extra webinars on, on leadership um, and, and how we can do that. But definitely check out the BPS stuff because that was they were really, really good. Um, you've mentioned webinars regarding formulation. Are these on YouTube? Yes, they are. They are fantastic. I will. Uh, at the end of this stream, I will try and link them. Or if you're on the Facebook group, join the Facebook group and I'll link them on there because they are fantastic. Um, I've not had a huge amount of experience in formulation. I've done... I've done a fair amount, but I haven't, it's not loads. Um, and even with the experience I do have, it's been really, really helpful. Um, yeah. And I don't think they're under, it's by Dr. Emily Barney, but it's not her that posts them. So I'll, I will find it and I'll post it on the uh, Facebook group for you because they are brilliant. And uh, I've got another question. I've only got two more, I think. Um, after finishing the doctorate, do you hope to work for the NHS indefinitely? Yeah, pretty much. I mean... When I first uh, started, I take, so in sixth form, we, my school didn't offer psychology. So I did like an open university psychology introduction to psychology module thing. Uh, and um, I remember reading something like starting salary is like 40 grand or something like that in the NHS. Uh, but if you're private, you can earn up to a hundred grand a year. And I was like, perfect. I'll go private then. Like I just... I didn't really know who I was as a human, what my values were and everything. And and I and I do feel conflicted, if I'm honest. You know, there's a massive part of me that wants to go and make loads of money. But then there's a, an even bigger part of me that cares about pe everyone being able to access services. So, yeah, that's my plan. Um, you know, depends how honest people are. I don't know. I don't know about anyone else applying and, and what their plans are. But for me, yeah, to stay in the NHS indefinitely, because I do think that we are leading in terms of mental health research, and there's not really a structure like the NHS. And I, I do think it's wonderful. I really, really genuinely do. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing this. Um, fabulous. Uh, thanks for that. Well, that was really interesting. Thanks. Uh, lovely. And uh, I've got another one here. Um, oh, I'm glad it was insightful. Thanks. Uh, how many work experiences needed to land an AP job in the NHS? I only have a master's in clinical psychology and I'm worried that's not sufficient experience. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, I'll go through my experience. So I did my undergrad at the University of West of England, graduated, then went straight on to do a master's up in Newcastle. Uh, it was foundations in clinical and health psychology. Then I uh started applying for assistant jobs and I was like yeah it's fine I'll definitely get one I'll definitely get one and then like a month later I was like it's fine I'll definitely get one <laughs> I'll definitely get one it'll be fine and then about three months later I was like okay I'm not gonna get one uh so I think I was applying for all these jobs and I don't know if it was the, the lack of experience because I didn't I had a little bit of community support worker experience that was not full-time uh, I had a little bit of group facilitation stuff. I had a little bit of research assistant experience. Uh, but I think what was more to do with it is that I just, I don't think my applications were very good, if I'm honest. You know, and, and when I wasn't being successful, I chased every single application. And I'm talking, I applied to 165 jobs after my master's. That is not to scare you um, because I was not limited to, I could go anywhere in the country. Um, I was happy to move anywhere. Uh, and I knew that getting an AP job, I classed it as a golden ticket to the doctorate. Who knows? The jury's still out on that one for me because I am still an AP and still not on. Um so I think it's really difficult. I think it really depends on who you are. But my applications were, were not good. And I sought uh, feedback. I did not get feedback on lots of applications. But I did get feedback from one in particular that I applied to in Dorset. And the psychologist I rang through and asked to speak to him. And he was very busy. But he made the time for me. He was like, I've only got two minutes. I was like, that's fine. Tell me about my application. Why was it? Why did it, you reject it? And he said, what you need to do is make every... Um, make it easy for me to give you the job, um, to give you an interview. So he was on the person spec. It always has like qualifications, knowledge and experience, skills. Have those as headings and then say how you meet each of them and show, de demonstrate how you meet each of them. 
after that, I did manage to get a job as a support worker in weight management in the NHS. Um, so I think the, the first thing to say is don't worry about your experiences. Focus on getting the application done right. And I would say go and get some experience that isn't an AP first. Like, I think it's great that people are able to get into AP jobs, like, straight after. Gra- I, I really do. Like, uh, it's not just me sounding bitter. I think it's really great and helpful. But if you're struggling, go for support worker roles. Um, I learned so much in my support worker role. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And uh, it was up north. And I now live <laughs> now live in Wales. But we move around. Um, but the only reason I left that job is is for family stuff. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't have done other, uh, otherwise uh, I'd probably still be there because they offered to give me an AP job and I couldn't and it was a whole thing but don't worry too much I think um, make the most out of your experiences and if you don't fit the job description or person spec think about how you haven't hit that so if it says um, experience of working with people with mental health difficulties and you don't have that experience I tried to like fluff it and pretend that I did have that experience but I didn't so go and get that experience somewhere else. And I know it's that horrible, oh, you need to have experience to get experience. I get that, believe me. I applied to AP jobs for four years. Uh, again, I think that's probably more to do with my applications than anything else. But uh, so after that, so I was a support worker for a year in the NHS weight management, loved it. Then I became a recovery worker in uh, a substance misuse service. Uh, I was there for about eight months. Then I became a senior recovery worker, so a team leader. Uh, And I think that gave me such confidence because it was a leadership role and it gave me confidence in speaking in front of people and interview. And I, you know, did interviews, you know, I was an interviewer. So I felt differently about doing interviews after having that experience. So I think that's why I was able to get an AP job and I had more experience and it was varied. Um, So, yeah, I hope that helps. But don't worry, don't panic. Just Support worker jobs are really valuable and helpful and also lovely most of the time. I loved mine anyway. Um, Fab? Oh, actually, we've come to the end of the questions. Yes. Yes, Hina, they have been. You're absolutely right. That's exactly who posted them. It's Saba or or Aksaya. Yes, that's exactly who it is. I will post it on the Facebook group anyway, um, but they're fantastic, they are. Anyway, any other questions? Um, thank you so much for engaging today, guys. It's been really, really helpful. Um, here are the next upcoming webinars. So Thursday, the 26th of November. Oh, I've got one before then. I don't know why that's come up. Thursday, the 29th of October, uh, we will be doing how to keep a reflective portfolio and the doctorate application, how to reflect in a doctorate application. So tune in for that one and I will make that recording available. The one after that is Thursday, the 26th of November, and that'll be looking at two different reflective models, Gibbs and Brookfield, and we'll talk about them, a bit of critique and everything like that. And then I'm having a break for Christmas, guys. If you celebrate Christmas, or even if you don't, have a little break. Do it. I'm giving myself a break because I've worked really hard this year and I think I deserve a little bit of a break. So I'm having a break and I'll be back in January. Um, So the first one of 2021 will be on the 21st of January at 7 and we'll be looking at two other reflective models. And if you want to get involved, um, you can click subscribe on a clinical psychology community uk on this channel that would be really really great and then you'll get notified for every um upcoming webinar or, or chat um and also join the uk declan site applicants reflective space on there there will be an extra unit how clinical psychology functions within the nhs it will have all the different resources that i've suggested and and links um to different things um and also give me any comments or questions on the facebook group that'd be really great Now, there is something we've started to do on the Facebook group, um, which is online reflective groups. If you have not got experience of a reflective group and you would like it, let me know. So on the Facebook group, I've popped in there an expression of interest form. It has a little bit of stuff that you might need to fill in um, just to help me match you up with the best group possible. So uh, it's it basically asks things like your name, your email, your job title, what you want to get out of the groups, what area you work in, those sorts of things. Um, But 
I've only had a few so far and uh, if you really want to then get on the Facebook group and um, and download that expression of interest form um, so I can match people up into a, into a reflective group because if loads of us lack that experience I didn't have any experience really of that until I became an AP and there's a fantastic AP peers you know I'm really lucky to have oh they're amazing APs that support every month we meet up and we you know to rotate in leading it and we do CPD activities and things and we can do that online we have the internet we can do this with people we don't know it's amazing so let's let's use these resources to do that um, and it will help us all develop better so let me know if you're confused about any of that let me know and I will help you out um, and there's also a feedback survey at the end of this there'll be a QR code for survey monkey so that'd be really great if you can give me some feedback I'd love that here are some helpful resources as I said I will make sure they're all available on the Facebook group um, so uh, don't worry about trying to click any of that down at the moment but thanks so much, everybody. I've had the highest number of people uh, ever watching today. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And if you know anyone else that might be interested, please invite them to our Facebook group. We're nearly at 700 members. I can't believe it. If we get to 1,000, I'll do another extra webinar on a topic of your choice. So let me know. Please invite people. It will be great. And here's the survey monkey. Thank you so much, guys. Um, and I will see you... I will see you in a couple of weeks when we do the uh, reflective portfolio and doctorate application one. Thanks, guys. Bye.